Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of the Athletes Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah McKendy. And I'm your host, John Bull. And we've got a really special guest, you know. I'm so excited this person's coming on. We've got a little bit of history from playing football in the days at Norwich City. So we've got Richard Brindley. And um, today we're talking about come up and struggles. And Richard's been so kind to sort of jump on and give his experience of his come ups and struggles right from academy days and grassroots. And um, we're a bit late, so he's. Uh, I've got to buy him a drink and a beer when I meet him face to face, and maybe a big bear hug as well. Look at him, look at that grin, beautiful. Uh, you're going to get a lot of Instagram follows after this, Richard, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> but Rich, why don't you give us a, a high level instead of me going into my backstory of how I know you? You know, tell us about yourself, summarize, best highlights playing in football. Okay, so in terms of how you and I met around that time, obviously. You and I met around 16, um, and that was at Norwich City Football Academy. Um, that was, shall we say, the start of, of a football career, of what it's really about, yeah. the good and bad. Um, but myself, obviously, I've been, I've been playing professional football. Um, I think I made it at 18, 19. Yeah. Uh, I went through the whole system, broke into the system, Broke into the academy age six, seven. Um, and I guess I was very fortunate in terms of plan A was was always always working. It was obviously yeah. there was times it felt like it wasn't going to work, but plan A worked and um worked my way through the whole system, like I say, from six to seven. Um, broke into, you know, being around the first team and all, all of that stuff and, and got my professional contract. And then the next part was then trying to maintain it. And being able to do that. So um, that's been the start of it all, shall we say. And obviously, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot more depth into that. So for the for the listeners right now listening in uh, and, and wondering, Richard Brindley, Richard Brindley, I've heard that name for somewhere. Give us a little bit of uh, the teams you've been to. So Norwich City was your first professional contract. I think you moved then to Colchester. Yes, I uh, started at Norwich and then, funnily enough, had a slight change of uh <laughs> of standards i then went to, for six months to chelmsford which was a conference south yeah and then left norwich city and then obviously had to climb back up so to speak um and then went to chesterfield after six months from conference south got my move to chesterfield in league two done exceptionally well six months later got another move to rotherham united which was then they had just been promoted to League One. And then awesome. that first year, we then got promoted to champ. So then I was at Rotherham for a couple of years. Um, and then after that, a couple of loan moves, um, Oxford United, Colchester, like you said, um, Scunthorpe United, a couple of clubs in League One. And then I ended up signing for League One, Colchester United. Um, and then there for a couple of years. And, and yeah, now I'm, now I'm at Notts County Football Club. So it's been a couple of clubs there. Yeah, fast, fast few years of experience there. We can call you Nicholas and Nelka. You've got a badge for every club that you've been. <laughs> but um, I just want to take it back a little bit, uh, just for a lot of the listeners. Um, obviously, you came through at Norwich. Um, mm -hmm. How was it like getting your first professional contract? Like, how did you get told? Um, and how was like the the second year um, youth team season for you? Uh, did you? expect the contract or was you you didn't know what the decision was going to be how was how was that final year as a scholar before you went pro uh, the, the final year as a scholar for me was a little bit unusual uh i had a an injury that had me out for about three to four months just before my contract was coming was expiring um so then i went from you know being in a strong position almost confident that I would get the contract. I think I had small discussions here and there uh, with the, well, with, with a, the academy manager and, and whatnot, those were that were looking after me at that time were, were, you know, highlighting that that contract would be there. And then all, all of a sudden I had that injury, uh, I snapped three ligaments in my ankle, had an operation. Like I say, I was out for three to four months and then I was like, okay, well, my, my contract's expiring. Yeah. And that was my first real experience of how quickly things can change. I went from being in a strong position with a 
knowing that I would be getting a contract and told yeah. to then the club almost reconsidering that and then changing the the decision in, in what terms of the contract would be. So um, that final year was very difficult, mainly because of that. But in other areas, being a, a youth team player, trying to break in um, that final scholarship year, you know, you look at, almost like I say, from the age of six, I had gone through the system, the same type of dynamic where, you know, you do a year or two years and then they have a meeting, they have a discussion in terms of whether you're going to sign a, an, another contract and they're going to keep you for the next year or two. And that was all, always the case. And then this was almost like the final, the final biggest hurdle that if you fall at this point, you know, it, it's, it's almost as if, when you're six and seven and you don't make it, it's, it's okay because, you know, you're still working out where you want to go, professions and, and, and whatnot. When you're around, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, them, them years there are critical. So um, the uncertainty that I had due to my injury was difficult. So, um, yeah, it was a very, very stressful time um, around that age. And um, fortunately, uh, signed a, a professional contract. Um, and yeah, then, then it was the case of getting my head down and trying to break in, into the first team. But that scholarship, I remember, you know, JB, JB knows obviously we were together at that time. It's, it's a really difficult time for the young lads because you are putting everything on the table and as much as you could well be prepared for, you know, plan Bs, you put so much time and energy into it that you, you almost you almost um you've almost given everything yeah and yeah. put everything on the table it's, it's like you, tunnel vision isn't it yeah literally so um football is you know it's not it's not a normal type of job where you can where you put everything into it and that everything isn't necessarily going to um damage you not so much multitasking but looking at other areas to improve on football is a, a daily mental physical requirement so um like i say you put everything on the table hoping that it works out yeah and for the you know for for prospects right now for for me personally for kids who are listening to this or get uh attuned into this um football and going through the academy um your expectations versus reality you might get a shock straight away um, so you might come through the academy, you might think you're doing well and, you know, you might think you're in the running for a contract and, uh, like Richard just said, something will happen, you know, you'll get injured, you know, the process of making a decision will change for you, Richard, you know, for me personally, when I went, uh, to Dundee, I felt there was a big difference between how Dundee sort of, you knew where you were at Dundee compared to the English clubs. So do you think that's an element of coaches and clubs in the UK versus other clubs like Scottish League? Um, did you know where you stood for that next contract or how well you were doing and how quickly did they pull it from under you? And just tell us that element and, and the feeling behind that. In terms of when I signed the, the first professional contracts or just in general contracts? In, in general. So uh, get in, did you always know you was going to get a contract after youth team days? And also when you was in your first year, did you know where you stood? Did you always understood where, um, if I keep playing well, uh, they're going to give me a contract or they've already told me they're going to extend it, et cetera? Mm. Well, starting with that first professional contract, I remember there was discussions and you have small talk with the, you know, the, the, the managers there, whether it's the, the first team manager, the assistant manager, your academy manager, youth team managers, you know, um, staff around the club. You have these small talk conversations and people will stop you in a hallway and, you know, say, you know, how are you? How are you getting on? And, you know, how's it, how are you feeling about the contract situation? And, um, you kind of get a vibe and you get a little bit of uh, an insight of where people are, what discussions have happened and, and what people's thoughts are and, and all of that stuff. And I had a slight insight that, you know, they wanted me to stay and, and there was a contract on the table. However, 
there was only one man that felt differently, which I didn't know so much at the time. Um, and that was simply the man that was, so to speak, the main man, the, the, the first team coach, the, the, the main manager. So um, forget my youth team manager, forget all the other staff that really liked me and saw the potential in me and, and felt that I fully deserved a new contract. That small talk and insight of what they wanted and were willing to push for me didn't really matter too much because the most influential person who made the final decision felt differently. Yeah. And that was, that was the manager at the time. So um, for me, that experience taught me a lot in terms of, you know, it's, it's not signed until it's signed, yeah. period. Doesn't matter how much, how confident you are within yourself. Doesn't matter whether you're agent, your parents, your manager, your youth team manager, whatever it may be, doesn't matter. Until that contract's signed, you shouldn't be celebrating. You shouldn't be, you know, the, the job is not done. So um, then finding that out was, was quite difficult and surprising. And then you learn that um, you might well deserve that opportunity, but if someone just generally doesn't believe in you and that person makes that final decision, unfortunately, whether it's unethical or not, that position is, that's the final answer. Um, Here's an important touch point, uh, Richard. Mm. Uh, so were you saying opinions in the game, grassroots games really determine a person's career? So you might be seen as a worldie by coaching staff and just one opinion could change the course of your career, your playing career and, and what your hopes and prospects are. Yeah, I think it plays, I think it plays a large part in, you know, we look at any job today and whether people will admit it or not, you are judged firstly by your appearance how you carry yourself what other people's opinions are of you that know you um, all of these factors come into it and you know if it's a person that makes that final decision that doesn't isn't fond of you um, doesn't see what other people see um, or feels just generally differently about you then unfortunately the chances are that the, the things are going to go more so the way that he chooses it or, or she chooses it. So um, opinions are massively important. And one of the biggest lessons that I was ever told was um, be careful of what labels are attached to you. Because once you get a label, whether you deserve it or not, whoever put that on you unethically or not, like I say, um, once you get that label, it's very, very hard to remove and it sticks. So that for me... I learned very, very quickly. And like we say, in, in contracts in general, that is very much so the case where um, it's very important that the opinion of the person that makes the decision likes you. And, you know, I think there's a lot of players in, in this industry that might agree on the fact that they've worked their absolute nuts off and done everything they possibly could and might well have equally the same potential as somebody else that's in the same position. But say the person that makes that final call um, likes, to the other person, likes the other person's personality better, you might equally, ability-wise, potentially be on the same path. But if that person likes that other, that other guy's personality or, you know, it could be the case that, Academy, that's that's how that's how it was. That, so. That's so striking for me, and and I'm glad you brought that up because being yourself in this game and being from grassroots, and I'm going to talk about it because it's something important to me and it's something that sits on my mind when I was growing up. But being black, just yeah. being of a different culture or origin, mm -hmm. and the way you behave and the way you've been brought up. Yeah. You know, we come from a background similar to yourself, Richie. Uh, if I'm wrong, l let me know. But we come from a background of our culture is very, you know, bubbly lads. We're, we're, you know, the way we are. Like to have a laugh. Yeah, yeah, like to have a laugh. We're energetic and, you know, but this transpires as, you know, when we talk to each other, like, bruv, the certain languages yeah. we use, mm -hmm. how we get excited and change room. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, from where our background's from uh, and how we are, we might be seen as disruptive. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you've got stories of that as well. I remember um, when we was in at Liverpool in the youth team, I remember one time there was just like a couple of us sitting in the corner and um, 
one of the lads turned around and said, so something, something, something. And he said the word bro. And then a coach walked past and said, bro, what mm. do you mean, bro? Like, speak properly. Yeah. So we've turned around and looked at him like, what do you mean, speak properly? Like, this is how we've yeah. grown up. This is how we speak, you know what I mean, to ourselves, you know what I mean? So it shouldn't be something that should be frowned upon, if that makes sense. Yeah. And but obviously, if you question them, then you get labelled as being a troublemaker, or as yeah. being disruptive and all that kind of stuff. So it's, a, it's something that obviously needs to be addressed. It, it, it's a shame because you almost have to be someone else that you're not. And your ability as a player gets put into question just because of the way you are, where you come from. Uh, Richie, when I came, remember when I came to Norwich 15, I was a raw school. Do you remember, remember them shorts I used to wear, them night shorts? Remember them white <laughs> remember, remember them white trainers I wore with the green night ticks and the, the gilet with the hoodie? I was just, <laughs> I was I was a rascal. But I was a rascal, but I was a fish out of water because I'd i am from City of Manchester, mm -hmm. just come to Norwich. And if anyone's been to Norwich, you know, they'll know it's not it's not very metropolitan city place, right? And I'm just in fish out of water. You know, I've got a bit of an attitude. I wouldn't say a chip on my shoulder, but you know, I had a bit of attitude, this Manchester attitude and confidence. And it was seen that the first year, you know, in the academy was hardest. And I'll be honest with you, I, you know, I, I'll say it now, I feel like I got bullied because of the way I was and the way I spoke and stuff. And I was labeled with that. And uh, in my in my head, I was thinking, wow, is it because I'm from Manchester or is it because I'm black? Mm -hmm. Is it because of my origins and stuff? And yeah. as I got older, I, I, I thought more about it. And you touched on it just now, Richard. And one opinion of what you like or who you are will dictate your future. Uh, and that's a shame. I think that's tragic. And, yeah. But it's the reality mm -hmm. of grassroots football and you know going through the system and becoming a professional, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things I want to touch on, um, once you broke into the first team, um, what was it like? Was it everything you expected or was it just a whole complete different story? Um, what was your journey uh, at Norwich in the first team? Um, it was nowhere near what I expected or what I hoped for. Yeah. Um, reasons being, you know, like I just mentioned the opinion of the person that was in control at the time um, made it a lot more difficult because you already know. I mean, let me just explain one thing here. When I did get the professional contract, I literally had been, no word of a lie, I literally had been refused. He, we sat down, had the meeting. He said, you won't be getting a new contract, right? Wow, wow. Um, Sounds like my situation. <laughs> and then... <laughs> this is this is this is the craziest part. So I'm literally about to leave, right? So I think everyone in my age group, the the second year scholars, everyone in my age group that was left that had their meetings, no one got offered a new contract. So they, the manager basically already had made his mind up where he didn't want youngsters, didn't want to bring them through to the system. He just wanted experience for you know for the for the first team. So. I didn't get a new contract. He said that, you know, I'd been released. I'm then literally walking out to my car. <laughs> and uh, the academy manager stops me, literally about to get into my car. He calls me, actually. He calls me and he says, just wait there. I'm coming. He comes. <laughs> what was he coming? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this sounds wow. crazy. Go he on. says, he says uh, just wait there. I'm going to pull up. So he comes over and he's like walking quickly to my car as I'm about to jet off. And he says, come in here, come come in the change room. We'll go into the change room, just somewhere private. Um, and he says, listen, I've had a chat with the manager. I told him, we can't let you go. We cannot afford to let you go. You're too good to be let go. So I've sat him down and said, listen, he needs to, he needs to wise up at the end of the day. We need, you're, you're good enough. You're more than good enough. As an academy product for the club, we need you. You're beneficial. There's a future here. So he said, I've managed to sit him down and basically renegotiate. Wow. So go back in now and have a chat with him again. 
Wow. What's going on here? This is yeah, obviously, yeah. we all know how meetings and contracts work, right? Yeah, Once you've yeah. made a decision, that's it. Like, yeah. That's final. That decision also is someone's life. So yeah, you yeah. make that decision fully, completely. So I've now gone back into the meeting and he's sat in there again, the manager. And um, he's obviously not too pleased. Sits me down and then he says, a lot of people like you here, which is really, really good for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a year contract and you'll be with the first team in the first team change room, you'll train with us, all of this, that and the other. Um, and yeah, that's that, all the best type of thing. So I've gone from, he doesn't, he clearly doesn't want me, he's released me to then someone having to stick their neck out and they put their job on the line for him to then give me a contract. But he's almost like he's giving me a charity contract. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm giving you it just to say and cover my own back yeah. on paper that yeah. I've done it, but I'm never going to give you a chance. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I bet you were, uh, I bet you had mixed emotion, but I, I, yeah. I can tell you were fuming, weren't you? Oh mate, I was 100 percent fuming. For me, I, I was already looking to go elsewhere. I, I wanted to try get another contract elsewhere, but the difficult thing is, you know, if you haven't played, I mean, what was I, 17, 18? So I, I haven't played first team games and, and all of that stuff it's hard to really break into, at the time, Norwich were in a premiership. So it was hard to match that. And that premiership experience, you know, the possibility of training every day with them and then possibly trying to get a loan maybe somewhere. That's how I kind of looked at it when I worked it out on my head. Um, and I didn't have any better offers at the time. So I obviously agreed the terms. But mentally, I knew that, well, this is, this is inevitable. No matter how hard I try, I'm, I'm actually never going to break into the first team. I'm going to get released after this extended year, this first professional year's contract. I'm going to get released after this if you're still here. So, you know, that was before I've even started. I already knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I had no choice but to yeah. take the contract to kind of try and set myself up after that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that uh, I don't think... I know that I, I would never experience that ever again. Yeah, yeah I, I it, it's not healthy. Ever. It's yeah. it's mental warfare, and you know, if we're, if we're talking about the mental health piece, how can you expect a player uh, what's going through their mind? And and I will play devil's advocate because some people might be listening and say, "Well, you had a year opportunity," but uh, I think what people need to realize is you're written off, and he sort of passed that down as a charity where how is that a equals a, you know fair starting point yeah uh, to really have a shot at mm. playing and a pre my thing level. is as well like when obviously when you sign your professional contract it's meant to be one of the happiest moments of your football footballing Absolutely. career you know what i mean yeah. um what was um let's say like with your family uh, obviously because that I remember with mine i went to sign up with my mom and stuff like that uh, what was the conversation like with your family uh, regarding you signing that contract? Because obviously you've gone from one minute being released to now being told you've got a year, knowing that you're going to get released again in 12 months. You know what I mean? What was their conversation with your family? Did you have like, any support with it going forward? To, to, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I was never really that close with my family. So in terms of family, you know, that support system, yeah. I lacked that. So at that age, um, you know, my, my parents weren't really there. My, my parents uh, had moved away um, and we only ever spoke when it was to discuss football, but they were, you know, pretty much on the, you know, on, on the outskirts of, of it all. So um, they weren't too, their opinions, you know, it wasn't really much in it and what they had to say. They kind of just said, you know, well, obviously your agent will have to, try and sort it out and do whatever you can. Um, I think they they did s try and see it from a positive outlook in terms of, well, you've made it this far and look at all the, the amount of people that haven't made it. Um, and the fact that somebody's literally put their neck on the line for you um, to, to, you know, it's a very unusual circumstance. Yeah, yeah so very unusual. Someone to stick their neck out for you in, in that type of situation says a lot. Um, about your ability and you know it just goes to show that I mean I'm, I'm I was able to get here without people liking me people 
you know, references or connections. It's just all been based off me as a, as a person and my personality. Um, so I've been very, very fortunate. But my family, um, you know, just try to see it from that outlook. Yeah. Uh, and then with my agent, I then had to, you know, work out at that age and we'll probably talk about that maybe uh, agents at that age if you're not playing first team football there's not a lot they they can't do any more for you than anyone else really they can't, they can't throw a magic wand unfortunately so the situation that I was in I had to adapt like you say as a prof- professional contract you should be buzzing and I wasn't yeah, I wasn't yeah. happy at all about the terms I felt like I was in a coldy sack but you have yeah. to try and play the game in terms of working out, okay, well, how do I solve this problem? And Mm. how do I get over this hurdle? Because there's no way I'm going to let someone, just because their opinion of me is, is, you know, they don't like me or whatever it may be. I'm not going to allow that to be everything that I've invested in this be taken away from me. So I had to find a solution. And what were the struggles that that you found, um, you know, mental, financial, uh, there's a lot more moving parts, you know, like Henot said, it should be the happiest time of your life, but you're actually mm. juggling a few things here, aren't you? Uh, in yeah. your personal life and as well as trying to, uh, trying to juggle it in your professional life as well. So what were the struggles, main struggles for you at that time? The main struggles for me at that time were, um, I'd say, that, that next year professional contract wasn't too difficult because you had money coming in a little bit at least. Um, and I think I was still living in digs. So I was quite fortunate with regards to that. It was then after that when eventually the inevitable happened where I did get released. Um, that then I had to work my way around almost adulthood, so to speak, of being released, still not play the first team game at 18, nine, just turned 19. I, th- no, I was 18, um, nearly turning 19, still not had played a first team football game. Then off the back of being released, finally, the inevitable, um, trying to find a club. You went from, well, I went from being at a premiership club to then you've got, Premiership, Championship, League One, League Two, um, Conference, I guess it was called then, National League now. Um, you know, you're looking at five tiers. No one wanted to touch me. No one at all. And you but go what, from... Why is that? I'm, 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 that's yeah. interesting. Why? You, you've got a, such a good pedigree. Because, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, for people who don't know, Norwich City was, was a good academy. It was a good pedigree. Uh, go into more detail. So why is it that the five tiers all of a sudden just you know, went ghost and stuff. The the biggest reason that I, well, the only reason that I received was he hasn't played men's football, which is first team football. Um, he hasn't played yet. He hasn't done that. So we are looking for somebody ready for first team football. Um, and that was always the answer for me. And I knew at 18, 19, ideally, I, I wanted to break into a first team. I didn't want to be in a, in a you know, what, what were they calling it? Uh, under 23s. Yeah, yeah, the time. Reserve team. I had been doing that. Um, I was in a reserve team from the age of 15 up until 18. So I was playing with first team players in the reserve team in and around it since the age of 15. And I was, you know, JB would tell you, I was always playing ahead of my ages and doing exceptionally well. So then at that point at 18, 19, unfortunately not getting that on paper, that app, the appearance that says he's played a first team appearance for this club in this league, no one wanted to touch me. And, and to a certain extent, you can, if you see it from both sides of the coin, from a manager's perspective in those tiers, um, if there's no referral, they don't know you, there's no connection. Yeah. And it's a lot, that's how they do it a lot of the time, whether it's the agent, parent, family, friends, or the other manager that you've previously had, a connection there normally plays 
the deciding part yeah. to a player getting something over the line. And people always think it's just an agent. It's bigger than that. It's deeper than that. Yeah, absolutely. But for me, you know, the, the, the managers didn't want to touch me because they didn't have that. And like I say, you can understand it because think of all of the players that get released year by year. Yeah. There's so many that just yeah, get left on their own. Mm-hmm. That managers almost don't have the time or don't have a system that creates time for them to be able to really look at potential properly yeah, so they literally yeah. just do it by looking on paper and saying he hasn't even played an appearance for first team football club yet so although he has most definitely definitely the potential from 15 to 18 playing for a reserve team playing with 30 year olds and whatever since the age of 15 like yeah. surely he's got to have something they don't see that they just see the paperwork so yeah, yeah. that was that was the main reason that unfortunately left me in a, in a, in a difficult position and then financially I then had to wait I mean, I had a, a few trials, whole city in the championship, um, and then uh, a couple other trials here and there. Eventually, like I say, I then went to Conference South um, at Chelmsford City, signed six months, literally cash in hand. Yeah. All that, you know, it must have taken me, like I say, six months until that deal came along, maybe a little bit longer, six to, six to 10 months. I then went with no money at all. And like I say, no family. I didn't have the, the best support system that my, my family are not. Um, didn't have a lot of money. So mm-hmm. I had to support myself. So be driving yeah. car, no car insurance, driving a cheap car and struggling to pay petrol. I used to have to ask my friends just so they could pay for my fuel, yeah. just so I could get about. It was that. It was it was hard times trying to just survive and doing things that I knew I shouldn't be doing if I get caught out and I'm going to get charged yeah. twice the amount that I'm trying to dodge. It was, that was the case for me trying to stay afloat. So, Yeah. And what's uh, one thing, you know, we had a conversation before the actual uh, recording of this podcast. There's a lot of things that I learned about you that I was quite shocking, you know, the stuff yeah. that you went through. And um, when we initially had the phone call and you sort of talked me through the stuff you went through, like this particular thing, I, I, I was really gutted because it, it, it says to me how many other kids like like you in that situation are current mm. now that are going through the same thing. Um, why isn't there a system in place for these guys uh, yeah. to really yeah. flush out their talents? Yeah. And um, just learning that new thing about, about you really did, it hit home because I was in the changing room, you, changing room with you when I was 15, 16. And um, I, I just I just find it unbelievable, to be honest. Yeah, because obviously I remember, uh, I think it was before we was in the youth team when we was younger. There used to be exit trials, didn't they, back in the day? But yeah. I think once we got to like youth team reserve ages, I think they yeah. got scrapped, didn't they? Yeah. Now it's just yeah. individual companies. But do you think like the clubs themselves and the PFA as well can do a lot more in terms of helping, let's say, Especially players at the time, let's say you was playing at Norwich and I was in the Prem. They're a big mm. club, you know what I mean? One of the biggest clubs in the country. You think more should be done to help those players to find other clubs or to sort out trials and stuff? Because obviously playing for a Premier League academy, you're among the elites of your Absolutely. age group in the country, if not in Europe, you know what I mean? You think more, a lot more can be done to make sure, one, players don't fall through the cracks and two... Um, players have enough mental health support going forward because like you said there's hundreds if not thousands of players each year who just fall out of football even though they've played at really really high levels yeah um you know i think i think today it's possibly one of the biggest subjects in football that has been untouched still today in terms of players that you know we look at the system we look at the industry and we think how many players um, try and make it and take that leap from a young age, the the sacrifice that they make to try and become a professional footballer. Um, it's it's unbelievable. This, it's a substantial amount of players that don't make it. It's scary. And players that are not making it in their childhood and also then players that are more, the more severe and concerning situation is, like I said to you in the earlier, is... It's all right when you're getting released at six, seven, ten yeah, years of course. Yeah. You're getting released at 18, 19. You know, people as human beings, you know, people, how it's not being understood or considered as, okay, 
we've got a footballing system here that's very different to a normal job. This is, you know, uh, this is a wonderful sport that brings so many people together and gives people opportunities. It's, it's, a, it's one of the main sports that helps people that come from, you know, a poor background. It's, it's, it's one of the best that allows people that don't have the resources to be something that they want to be. It gives us the allowance to do that. And it's amazing that how the industry is built that we haven't yet crossed that path and even really put time and energy into it. Okay, okay great. Listen, I don't know the PFA in details. You know, we all have worked with them when we were um, – academy and whatnot and had the meetings they come in every now and then twice a year whatever it may be and that's all good but there has to be more done in terms of like you say being able to look after the mental health side of things and trials if there are opportunities after that there has to be some type of system a core installment put in place that allows these 18, 19 year olds, especially the teenagers, an opportunity to kind of, you know, eradicate or like I say, in my situation, it was very lucky that I've made it, but I I was in an unethical situation where someone didn't want me because they just didn't like me. Not because they didn't think I was good enough. They just didn't, they just, they, they had their own plan for it. The manager had his own plan for where he wanted experienced players because he wanted promotion quickly yeah. and to get his career where he wanted to be as a manager. So yeah. he knew for worth, I can't take time and I haven't got time looking after youngsters and coaching them and building them. I just yeah. need people, men that are ready now. So he was looking after himself. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's important that we have the systems in place because it's an industry that's very, very competitive, yeah. not only as us as players, but also yeah. the managers and above that where everyone that makes final decisions on us where if technically speaking if we look at the umbrella we're at the yeah. bottom of it where we are almost powerless it, isn't it frightening that an industry football the amount of money that's churned in the industry yeah. there's not an infrastructure in place to set this up it, it's it's all it's astonishing right down from the fa pfa and, and look maybe it is a conversation, another conversation where we actually look at the details and the figures of what the PFA are doing, the FA are doing. But mm. the fact that we've come this far and there's so much money in football, resources mm. have not been allocated and infrastructure has not been built to protect the future of these kids that go from 12 all the way up to 18, 18 adults mm-hmm. and being, yeah. I'm going to say, it, left for dead. Yeah, literally. Uh, to fend for themselves. Mm. Uh, um, also, do you think um like the scholarships in england do you think they they could be changed or reformed uh for example like compare it to the american way of doing it uh i had a couple of friends that were at sheffield united uh good players but they never got their pro contracts um three of them all went to america uh one ended up actually playing in the mls for uh, salt lake city the other two they done their years in college um got a good degree they've come out both got good jobs now they still played football arts in college, um, got a degree and they didn't obviously make it in football, but they've come out of it with a good job whilst the other one is pushed on and is now playing professional football. Do you think a system similar to that could be implemented in England to almost like, because like, like you said before, once you got released, mm. you didn't really know anything in terms of like life skills or how to do this, to do that. Do you think more needs to be done in the scholarship stages for in terms of developing the players, because you are 16, 17, 18, to get you ready for adulthood, do you think more yeah. can be done? Or, 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 you know, adding to that, setting a precedent for the scholarship uh, scheme, uh, a precedent that, you know, kids understand, right, this is the next step, step after scholarship if I don't have a contract. This is the next step for yeah. me if I do get a contract, but I'm mm-hmm. not going to get a look into the first team. Yeah, that's that's 100%. Um, a requirement I think as you've laid it out I think that's exactly what is needed in terms of the scholarships at them well from when I was a scholar all I remember was you've got these other options that you can do um, and will help you with the first step maybe and it's the very very 
bare minimum basic step that if you were to go into that job or apply for that job, wouldn't be enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's yeah. like we've done it, bare, we've done the a bare, bare minimum, minimum. we've done yeah. just a little bit to yeah. say, here we go, done, off, off our list, there we go. We, we've yeah. said what we need to do legally or whatever it may be, the PFA. Just, just to touch it. on that, Richie, sorry for cutting you in there. Uh, do you fine. mean the... Um, you know, when we went to college and we did the courses, <laughs> the coaching courses, <laughs> they were rubbish. Yeah. They oh, were well, rubbish. I think you could have used that time more wisely. You know, Absolutely. You could have, people could actually, like you say, it's totally right, where that someone needs to be able to have the authority um, and responsibility to speak with us in at that age and say, okay, listen, this is very, very important because it may not work. Um, and we need to simply provide and go through a list of things that you feel that you can or can't do, or let's say can do. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to have, we've got, we're affiliated or connected with, I don't know, let's just say Open University or uh, LinkedIn or whatever it may be. They do amazing courses and stuff. Let's say there's, there's this type of affiliation and, you know, you get, provided that whereas with pfa you've got these pfa courses pfa courses are again like i say just the bare minimum that's not that's not enough to kind of put on paper and go to a manager saying listen i would love to work for you here's my application people are going to look at it and say okay that's great but that's yeah there's no, that's nothing enough. yeah so, yeah i totally agree on that yeah and, and, and richie just to you know dropping some gems and some knowledge for people listening in or who catch wind of what we're trying to do here and bring to light. Uh, mm. For you, what are the three absolute don'ts, you know, in hindsight of your experience and what we discussed today? You know, yeah. there's a Richard Brindley somewhere who's 16 years old uh, who wants to know, what should I do um, to better my situation? Um, give us three things and give us also three things what I definitely shouldn't do. Uh, in the situation, right down from receiving a scholarship, not knowing what your future is, or receiving that first year pro, uh, what you should do and what you don't do. Um, are we talking before you make it professional, yeah? Yeah. So e even if getting your first contract, you know, what are the three best advice you can give to someone, a, a Richard Brindley somewhere else at a Tottenham or a City, mm. uh, going through the same process or going through the same experiences that you've gone through? What sort of gems could you drop for them now? For me, I'd say, you know, I've, I've gone and done this myself. Um, and unfortunately, I've had to kind of search for it myself and find find answers. But if you're in a position, you know, first and foremost, like we're talking about, there should be something in place where they are assisting you in these areas. But three key main areas for me are... Plan B, a plan B is an absolute must and well and truly yeah. understanding what you, I mean, the bottom line is unless you're making millions and millions of pounds, yeah, you can't retire at the lower levels. You, you can't just relax at 35 and that's you done. And Correct. even if you were relaxing and millionaire, whatever it may be, you probably want to do something anyway. So a plan B should be essential and that should be the first main target that you set yourself and understand what that is going to be. So you do your studies, you understand what it is you might well be passionate about. Um, you look at that, you weigh up that stability in terms of whether you can see yourself doing that long term. If you can, then you have a, you have a chance in, in doing something as a plan B. It also mentally helps you and puts you in a place where you feel a little bit more comfortable, yeah. where you're not the anxiety, the pressure, the stress you put on yourself to become a professional footballer, but also to maintain, stay in it, yeah. I think is a little bit unhealthy. Yeah. So You're providing prepared. that kind of gives you that little bit of stability, comfortability yeah. and stability yeah. in terms of what you, you worked hard for that. And you also deserve, you know, to be able to enjoy it, not be stressed out. I know a lot of footballers that will talk about their depression or mental health because they're, they're nervous about today's game because... Yeah the environment that they're in is the case of it's a results business and, and one yeah. weekend you're doing great. The next weekend, it's a very, very stressful environment and, and yeah. it causes a knock on effect. So that would be my first point. The second point 
is your investments, understanding yeah. how, That's where, a major when key. Yeah. you're going major to key. is an absolute must. And getting that, whether you like it or not, drilling that into yourself. And like I say, it'd be helpful if you had someone you could trust and there was a system in place that provided that. But unfortunately, we don't have that so much at the moment where you have that in yourself to be able to invest wisely and understand where you can invest your money monthly, your earnings, yeah. whatever it may be. There's a, a certain percent that comes out of your income monthly. And if you can't do that, then you sit down with your parents or whoever may be, you know, assisting you or close to you and saying, yeah. listen, I need this X, Y, and Z amount of money being put away every single month. Yeah, annually it will compound and all of that stuff and you'll be in a much better position save for a rainy day yeah absolutely and the third for me is be present and learn to appreciate it day by day every single day you're in it make sure you give your absolute best and you do your absolute best, not for anyone else, but for yourself. There's a lot of people in the industry that it's a, it's funny because we're in a sports game. It's a, yeah, you know, it's a team game, but it's a whole bunch of individuals, really deep down, and no one really knows that when they watch on a TV screen. But it is it's a bunch of individuals just trying to look after themselves and their own family, and no one. I say no one. I know a few good people in this industry, so. I will vouch for that, but there are many in the industry that don't necessarily want you to do better than them. Yeah, yeah. So be, and be selfish and enjoy your lane. Yeah. Absolutely. Give your absolute best. Look after yourself. Look after your health, whether that's physical, mental. Make sure you take absolute good care of that um, and work hard. Yeah, that's that's a major key. So don't. Go on. What, what should you do? absolutely do not do Richie. Uh, don't okay okay i've got my first i'm gonna go by experience on this yeah um my first don't is to keep things financial other areas of your life you know whatever it may be, personal stuff. Keep it um, within people that you trust. Yeah. Don't expect people to do things for you. The biggest lesson that I've learned is I've built connections for myself and I've taken the time to speak to people on a level and call people, text people, ask them, ask them how they are, build an actual real human connection with people rather than in the football industry asking my agent mm -hmm. or someone else to build those connections for me. Yeah. So when I need these people, I can, you know, I, I, I have that, that middleman, so to speak, doing it for me. And I think if you have an agent doing that for me, the first and foremost, you're going to have to pay them for that. Yeah. And second, it's not a great life lesson personally where you are simply relying on other people to do to do your job, to do a man's job. And, and for me, the, the biggest lesson in that is, is making sure that you take accountability for yourself and you carry yourself how, how it should be. And, and you make sure that you, you take the time to actually build that and speak with people and, and, and build a community connection within the industry um, yeah. yourself. So, so don't be a liability to yourself. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. You put yourself in a, in a powerless position. Yeah. Love that. Second don't would be simply don't take it for advantage. Don't, don't take it for, uh, for granted and don't take advantage of being in a good position when you are doing well in a football game. Say you've signed a great contract or say you've just got promotion or you've had one good year. Don't ever take it for granted because there will be downs. There will be disappointments and there, there will be another difficulty. And that's just not, that's just not only football, that's life yeah. where, you know, we see that we'll have a great 
couple months or a great year and then another problem will arise and, and you've got to be good at problem solving and football is the exact same. If not, the problem solving is, is probably, if anything, more frequent. It's a daily, weekly basis. Mentally, it's yeah. it's a high demand. So um, I would say, you know, don't ever take it for granted. Make sure you continue to to just simply focus on being consistent. Yeah, um, that, that hits home because... Um, uh, you know, for, for, for listeners in that situation, because uh, I did it, Norwich got promoted and I tried to ride on that success coattail yeah. and I fell off mm-hmm. working on myself, took it for granted. Major key. So if you're listening in, major key. Just because X and X is doing well, mm-hmm. don't think that you can ride on that coattail mm-hmm. because there will be a bad day. Yeah, And then, you know, you've got to show for it. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. Definitely. My last and most is it, it's cliche, but it's um, very, very important. It's you just don't give up. You don't take no for an answer. I think the better you can get at um, putting yourself in a positive headspace um, and believing that you can get what you want and working hard to achieve that, don't take no for an answer be persistent, be, to, be determined. You can install these habits within you. Um, I think it can serve you in the long run. The sooner, the better you install that. If I would, if I could tell my younger self that, um, you know, well, 18, 19, 20, if I could have changed things, what it would have been is don't just be, I mean, I, I was doing extras, right? But I wasn't working on the most important things. I was just working on just, you know, it might have been things that looked good, yeah. you know, technically looked mm-hmm. good or whatever it may be. Work on things that think, really think about your game and really think about your position as a youngster and have a look at the ones, the first team players that are in that position. See what they're not doing well enough. Yeah. And then see how you can improve on that and how you, because that will get you to a point where you're not just working for working sake and working hard and you're seen in the gym and you're, you're lifting weights every single day. That's great that you're working hard and you're going home, you're tired, but is that getting you closer to where you need to be on the football pitch? So I think working smart and, and working on the most important areas that are going to um, eliminate the challenges and condense that much more i think that's where you can start as a youngster and then you can work on the other little things if anything it might well connect and and align and come together but if you can just focus you know you give yourself instead of 20 things that i need to do 20 challenges or 20 things that i want to be as a professional footballer i want to be strong quick i want to be able to cross i want to be able to shoot and my left foot slow down and just break it down the 20 cross them all off just do three think about the three most important ones yeah couldn't agree more because it it sort of it, it highlights you as a uh, a specialty sort of thing. It's it's like right. I know that player can do that particular thing, and we need that mm. in that team. Uh, and, and you give yourself the best shot. Uh, mm. Completely agree with that. What what a way to round up the segment that we've just had yeah. now, Richard. And uh, you know, can't appreciate you more for coming on and sharing your experience. Pleasure. And uh, I feel like there's a more flushed out uh, conversation to have in particular, like you said, the system and the infrastructure in place and what resources have been put into place to help kids. But uh, I'm so glad you came on to highlight your experience and what people, particularly you, are going through right now as well and what you've been through. So couldn't couldn't be happier for you to come on and, and drop some gems for these guys. Um, My pleasure to talk to you yeah. guys. And any closing statements from you? Um, I'd just like to say thank you for coming on again. And if you'd like to shout out your handles on social media so the people listening or watching can follow you. Yeah, well, it's Richard Brinley. <laughs> He's famous. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that blue tick. Just that, That's all you got to know. Perfect. He's got uh, the blue, uh, blue tick. <laughs> what's, I mean, what's your Twitter though, Richard? Twitter is rbrindley2. Yeah. Instagram is just Richard M. Brindley. Perfect. So Brilliant. make sure to check out Richard on all social medias and make sure to check us out on Athletes Culture on all social medias as well. Thank you for coming on, Richard. Thank you. Appreciate you, Richie. Appreciate